Okay, guys, let's kick off uh, the teaching, and we're just going to talk about the use of echo specifically in respiratory failure. So these are really common questions, and they're really common questions that I think are done rather badly in the exam. There's, the stuff is not rocket science, but it's all about, I think, reading the question and trying to figure out what the examiner's going to ask you. And we'll start off with trying to do a... Uh, we'll do the written question first of all, and that's where it's really important to read the question. In the exam, uh, sorry, in the VIBA exam, I think the VIBA will very much be along uh, how ECHO can help in the management of the patient. And let's just talk, I'll, I'll try and explain what I mean by the difference of that. I was just trying to think of every single question that could possibly be asked about respiratory failure and the use of ECHO. So I'm not going to lung ultrasound, I think we'll do it another time. And I guess the, 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 the bunch that I sort of came up with were, I guess the bad uh, effects uh, of ventilation on the heart. I think we can talk about RV size and function. pulmonary hemodynamics, and we can talk about TTE versus TOE in rest failure. And then the final one, which is I think the one that as an examiner I've been pushing for, is going to be talking about something like uh, echo use in management of a patient with ARDS. Maybe, yeah, maybe we'd say bad slash good here. Yeah, so I mean, these are, uh, and if you think of other ones, maybe just, uh, you know, unmute yourself and give us a shout. But I think in terms of the way that you'd write a question on respiratory failure with the use of echo, it's either going to be yeah, heart and lung interactions. Talk to me about the right ventricle, including pulmonary hemodynamics. If you're going to do a toe, what are the good things and bad things? And then the big one, which I think is this one, which is the one that's often asked and often badly done, is the echo in the management of the ARDS patient. And I think this is the one that I'll try and focus on uh, with the majority of it. Um, because I think it's different, right? If someone's asking you about how you use echo in the management of someone with respiratory failure, I'm not asking you how do you assess RV size and function. I'm not asking about you know, heart-lung interactions. I'm talking about how you use echo to guide, to make sure your patient's not fluid overloaded, to make sure you don't blow out the RV. If the RV is at risk, what's your, you know, how do you use echo to help guide your RV protective approach to mechanical ventilation? Yeah, and that's why I think the DDU, you know, obviously the DDU is a very clinically orientated exam, as I've said again and again. And so it's, you know, it's not a sonographer's exam, which is sort of more, I guess some of this stuff here is more about, you know, read a textbook, make sure you know how to assess the right ventricle. But to be honest, as an examiner, I feel like you're going you're gonna to know this if you're coming into the exam. What you might not know and what's important for people who've got the DDU is knowing how to integrate your echo findings into your management of a sick patient. Yeah? Okay. Why don't we just start off? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, doing a seminar, sorry. Um, cool. Let's start off with just talking about a few of these things. All right. Uh, Raymond, hi. First time at Fight Club, so you get to, uh, you get to go first. Let's start with our first one. Let's talk about heart-lung interactions. Right? <clears throat> so heart-lung interactions. Um, yeah, tell me about that with a particular patient who's on full mandatory ventilation. How is that going to affect the heart? Okay, well, they, well we're going to explore the effects of a uh, PEEP on uh, the conversion the system. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, the uh, effects of uh, um, uh, positive pressure ventilation with the yeah. uh, changes in respiration and how it might affect the right and the left heart. Beautiful. So um, I think you talk about increased positive pressure in the thorax. Beautiful. Yeah. How that's going to affect your RV and how yeah. it's going to affect your LV. Beautiful. Take mm -hmm. me through the RV first. 
Okay, well, so on positive pressure ventilation and inspiration, there's going to be a reduction in preload and that on the right side of the heart. So yep. you're going to expect um, uh, uh, a re reduction in the size of the RV um, and, and also a reduction in trans tricuspid uh, flow. Yep. Um, a concurrent, uh, so we we're just talking about the RV. Um, and then in... Yep, and then in uh, in expiration, the opposite will happen. So there'll be an, a, a relative increase in the um, in the in the in the preload, and, the, and therefore also an increase in the uh, trans tricuspid uh, mitral flow. Um, so uh, so the, 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 these will have concomitant effects on pulmonary um, uh, pressures transiently as well, um, and on uh, obviously on the volume in the uh, pulmonary circulation. Yep, fair enough. Yep. Uh, uh, so for me, that's some of the big things are. Sam, Sam, Sam's talking about uh, mandatory ventilation. Though. I'm just talking about mandatory ventilation. We'll keep it simple, just with that for the moment. Yes. So, so it's reversed. So in inspiration, you get positive pressure, so it's reduced preload, and then expiration increase. Why don't we keep it so Rather than just before we go into the inspiration versus expiration, just talk to me about just increased like positive pressure in the in the lungs. And well, I think we'll, we'll use when we get onto things like pericarditis and tamponade in a couple of weeks. Then we'll talk about that in a bit more detail, just to make sure we get through everything for respiratory failure. So get hold hold off on hold off on that stuff. Not saying any of that wrong, but we'll come on to that another time. Sure. So okay, we're going to decrease preload. Yep. And we're doing that because we increase pressure inside the chest. We also yep. squash the diaphragm down. Mm -hmm. You always need that pressure difference from in the IVC to in the right atrium. And I guess for me, it's uh, when you put on someone on positive pressure ventilation, they both go up, but the pressure in the right atrium goes up more than in the IVC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if that's, that's normal, in the right atrial pressure, IVC pressure, obviously flow dif um, pressure difference means flow happens. They both go up, but the uh, IVC to a lesser extent, so you've got a smaller difference. So that's the decrease in the preload into the right ventricle. Okay, yep. Cool. Yep. What about the afterload? Afterload, um, uh, well, complex. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on, us, on CO2, it depends on oxygenation. Nice, um, nice, nice. Yeah, cool. And we'll come on to that in a sec. Yep. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in contractility, um, uh, on uh, positive ventilation doesn't have effects per se on contractility. I agree. I think it's probably more over here, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. So I think if you've got decreased preload and increased afterload, uh, and I just mean, I guess, with increased positive pressure, expanding up the, uh, I agree, I think it's complex. It sort of depends on the underlying alveoli, right? Mm. I think we have got alveoli that are squashed. Uh, so if you've got atelectasis, atelectasis yeah and you open up uh and positive pressure can open up those alveoli you can improve yeah. oxygenation decrease mm -hmm. co2 yeah and in uh and reduce reflex yeah. pulmonary vasoconstriction which mm -hmm. actually means that you might be able to in fact you might be able to decrease afterload in that mm -hmm. yeah 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 as opposed to if you've got normal lung and you are over distending them mm -hmm. over distension and that will lead you to increased afterload. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll just do it like that. Yeah. So we're definitely yeah. going to decrease preload. We can increase or decrease afterload depending on the physiological state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What happens if we really, really increase the, if we blow out the right ventricle? I think that can also... I think you've got to be able to say that if you increase up the afterload too much, that can lead to uh, septal deviation. So we'll call that ventricular interdependence. Mm -hmm. Interdependence. So what's the effect on your left ventricle now? Um, uh, uh, there. Uh, uh, I was going to say increase in preload, but not not exactly. I mean, there's a support. There is. Yeah, I guess it. it it's dependent, isn't it? Like the overall effect is is actually a, a, a reduction in um. In the pressure. <laughs> so I, I think we get a reduction in preload because yeah. we, with the decreased preload here, yeah. maybe the increased afterload here, yeah. and the ventricular interdependence, we can decrease preload, 
yeah. and we can decrease the diastolic function. Yeah. So mm -hmm. with that ventricle being the, the interventricular septum being pushed across, that and pairs filling for that mm -hmm. left ventricle. Beautiful. What does it do to afterload? Reduction. Nice. Why? Um, the, the the difference between thoracic and abdominal pressure uh, is probably the main. The thoracic thing. and abdominal. No, well, extra. I was going to go into cardiac pressure. Into cardiac. Yeah. Okay. Is, yeah. Uh, remember, what's the uh, afterload? Is uh, I'll try and get this right. So what is it? Two times radius times by the trans mural pressure. Mural pressure divided by. Have I got that right? Divided by. Uh, sorry, I've got my equation wrong. All I remember is that this is definitely the important bit, right? And that's the again the difference inside the heart to in yeah. the pleural cavity. Yeah. So that if we stick someone, and that difference there is the afterload of your left ventricle. Yeah. So if we stick someone on positive pressure ventilation, we obviously increase up the pressure in your pleural space. We increase up the pressure mm. in your heart, but you increase up the mm. pressure in your pleural space more. So if that difference mm. is there, and then you stick someone on positive pressure ventilation, it goes like that, you reduce mm. your afterload. Sorry, I forgot my equation. Something like that. Anyway. On the inverse, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, decrease afterload, and that's... And that's going to be super important when we're starting to talk about people off positive pressure ventilation because that is going to lead to decreased, uh, what do you say, decreased uh, work that the heart has to do. So if you take positive pressure ration away, you're going to increase the work that the left ventricle has to do. Mm -hmm. well, thank, thanks, Raymond. I'll let you meet yourself again. Are there any questions about heart-lung interactions? I think... I find this really, really hard. That kind of simplifies it maybe a little bit too much, but it's the way if I was going to try and answer a question on heart lung interactions, just kind of try and split it up so at least you can make sure that you mention everything as you go. Any questions on that before we move on? Yeah, how much physiology would they want? I mean, um, I think... I feel like I'm having a primary viva. Yeah, totally. Because uh, I think this would be in terms of echo, you can assess all of this. And I'm starting off with this because we're going to go into all of it, right? Because we can assess that with echo, with fluid assessment status, right? So in someone, you've got to make sure that someone is not uh, underfilled. So that's going to come into the management of the ARDS patient. You've got to make sure if they're, you know, someone's in respiratory failure and on loads of inotropes, you've got to make sure you've got adequate preload. And so we could talk about fluid assessment in that. If we want to talk about afterload, well, that's, pulmon that's RV size and pulmonary hemodynamics that we're just about to come on to. If you want to talk about preload and diastolic dysfunction in this, this is particularly the question on weaning someone from mechanical ventilation. And if they're failing, is it because of this? So I guess that's why I was starting off with this, because I think you need a framework in your head. Because if, if we ask a super generalized question, you've got to be able to hit all of those marks, because if it's... You know, I guess this is where it comes to in that management of the patient with ARDS. I'm not going to go into depth talking about how to examine diastolic dysfunction, but I'm sure as hell going to say, you know, you've got to assess diastolic dysfunction. And if we've got to mention all of these things, you know they're only asking for a sentence or two. And it's that idea of it's the same as in the exam, like the, the SICKM exam. If they're saying, you know, how do you manage someone with ARDS, you've got to think broad and answer all the questions and you don't just get locked into how to optimize PEEP. You know, you've got to talk about patient positioning, uh, you know, inadequate suctioning, blah, 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 blah. I, I guess that's all I was trying to get out with starting off with this. Cool. All right, let's move on. All right, who's next? Uh, Hatim, let's talk about... Um, let's talk about that next thing that was on the list, which is assessing RV size. Okay, so talk to me about uh, how you assess RV size. So RV size assessment would be with the diastolic and systolic dimensions of the okay. right ventricle, uh, mm -hmm. and as well uh, noting for the respiratory cycle uh, during inspiration and expiration. Uh, so the size uh, probably during the, uh, the assessing the volume as well, not just the size, not the dimensions. Okay. And uh, to get a proper view first for the RV side, for the RV, which potentially could be done through the uh, apical four chamber view, yeah. or uh, done through a subcostal view, and then after that, uh, averaging uh, 
the, the views and the dimensions and the identifying whether there will be any increase in the size or not, which will be reflecting the volume overload in that context. Okay, have you got any numbers in your head? Uh, I'm not entirely sure, but I think it was 3.5 and 4.5. Nice. So, uh, so let's just, we'll split it up a little bit and we're going to try and do it like in a systematic way. So first of all, you're talking about dimensions for RV size. Yep. Okay, what would be, uh, so we'd do that in the apical four chamber view. We'd look at our... Okay, so you'd measure it in the apical four chamber. And we can measure it at the basal level, at the mid level, at mid -level and, at and that level there. Yes. Yeah, do, you know, do you know any numbers? Uh, not on top of my head, but I think it was 35 millimeter and 45 millimeter sistery and battery. 42, 36, and 86. I don't think, you know, if you've got the numbers, stick them in. You know, draw something like that in the exam, that's totally cool. Uh, if you don't know the numbers, it's not the end of the world. Just knowing that you've got to look at it in the apical four and measure at the base, the mid, and the longitudinal section would be fine for me. Beautiful. So you can also do the area. Yep. Uh, the area in there. And I guess volume, if you want to do volume, I think that's going to be on 3D. 3D, yep. And I guess some of the work that I've done on that is just rubbish, to be honest. It doesn't really match up. It's really hard to do uh, in, with transthoracic. And I've never done it with toe. I guess it's not being used a lot. Beautiful. And tell me about uh, what else? Any any other ones? Uh, so that is for the size as well. Would be for the subjective. Uh, what about the subjective assessment of it? Because that's probably so what the, do the, most yeah, the comparison between the RV and LV sizes, and the normal uh, ratio should be a point six or yeah. less. Uh, if there is any, if the RV size is nearly the LV size, this definitely denotes an increase in the uh, dimensions or the size of the RV. Fantastic. And I'll also talk about the apex, you know, if you're starting to get uh, yeah, well, the, apex, RV, the right ventricle RV, in the heart, that's enlarged. Yep. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, cool. Now, take me to the next step. If I'm talking about how do you assess RV size and then function. Say again. And then RV function? Yeah, we're going to come on to RV function. So first of all, if someone's talking about assessing RV size, let's just stick with that for the moment. I think it's, you know, this is, this is the textbook, right? We talk about subjective assessment, dimensions, area, and volume. And I think in any exam question with a DDU, you've got to take it into that thing that, you know, they love in the Sikkim exam again is, you know, in my practice, I do this. You know, I, I, I think it's, for me, the, the in my practice, is that we can actually assess RV size in our parasternal long, short, apical four, and subcostal. Apical four is the one that we're talking about for all of these, but I, I think that we do it in other ones as well. Yep. You look at it in your parasternal long and you start to get an idea of it, but we don't rely on it. This is actually my go-to view in terms of if I think there's, oh, hang on, the parasternal long axis, parasternal short axis. The parasternal short axis is what I'll go to to check another one. And so that's why I, my big saying is if you've got an abnormality in one plane, you've got to back it up in another. And particularly I go to the parasternal short axis for you to back it up. Yeah? You know, I think and if you've got someone writing that kind of thing in the exam, you straight away know that actually, you know, this, you're more likely to get marks, I guess, in other areas of the question if you kind of bugger it up a little bit, because I know you're not just reading it out of a textbook. And if you've forgotten to mention area, you know what, I'm probably still going to give you the marks because you're a damn good clinician because you're making sure you don't make shit ass decisions. Because I think, sorry, bad decisions. Because I think you, you know, I am presume we've all got... Uh, cases in our head where we've had junior doctors that have come up and said, I think this patient's got a PE because they've got a big RV because it's super easy to mess this one up or shorten it. For shortening if you do yeah. shortening. So if there is ever a question on RV size, I think in the exam, you've got to put this in it. Just find a way just to put in one or two sentences because if you write this down, they're going to know that you're sensible. And one of my biggest fears of teaching ECHO is that people aren't sensible and order too many CTPAs or VQs 
and God mm-hmm. forbid thrombolize someone like they did downstairs in the ED a few days ago. Yeah, because they were off axis. Patient was sick. They were off axis. They were hypoxic. They thought there was a big RV. Perry arrest and they thrombolized them. The patient was okay, but you go and look at their heart straight after that, and it's totally fine. They're, 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 they're hyperdynamic, and they were mm. perry arrest for other reasons, right? So yeah, that's the little tip and trick for the RV size. Cool. Um, thanks, man. Vishal, how about you take us through RV function? Sure. So RV function, so first it could be localized and generalized. So yeah. localized, you know, so the simple things we start with the TAPSI, which is, you know, less than 15 inch abdominal. Yep. S prime, less than 9.5. And uh, then in the generalized thing, so, you know, like S prime, if I'm really concerned. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, eyeball. Yep. And the fractal area shortening less than 30%, uh, 35. <laughs> you want to be really fancy, you talk about that, but don't mention RV free wall strain without talking about that one first, right? Cool? Yep. Uh, nice. Um, what do you mean about the regional wall? So regional wall, um, it's not simple, but you know, few science like McConnell science, it's useful, you know, to do a lot of embolism. So there's a hypokinesia free wall of the right ventricle in that. And uh, so that's one. And uh, also the thickening of the right ventricle free wall is important that would you know, differentiate between acute and chronic. Good work, good work, yeah. And less than five millimeter is normal. Yeah, good. Yes. And, uh, and also because in the right ventricle assessment, acute core pulmonary is important. So in that, it's important, you know, the to differentiate whether it's acute or it's chronic. Let's put this in there. There's just one paper by a really amazing sonographer who works with Tom Marwick, and I can send that out if you're interested. It was in, in Jace last year, where she found out that using strain, that if you have acute dysfunction you're more likely to have the base and the mid down. If you've got more chronic function, it's more the apex and the mid that are down. Just uh, to talk about regional wall, and obviously that's the McConnell sign. Yeah, and this you'd have RV wall greater than five millimeters. Beautiful, uh, yeah, nice. I think it's important again, same as the last question, if you talk about eyeballing it, totally, totally good thing to do. Uh, we're basically, we're okay in terms of picking up normal versus abnormal. When we start to get into moderate, mild, moderate or severe, we're not so good. Yeah. Okay. So, All right. So he's APO came in or APO? So we... Oh, sorry, I can't, can't hear that. Say that again. Was someone talking? Um, no, okay. Um, right, let's talk about the next one. So, why don't we just jump just to the meaning of time? Let's talk about the management of the patient with ARDS. So, so what's the. I'm just thinking, you know, if we put him on a press, it's going to be. I'm sorry, the uh, differentiating between pressure overload and volume overload at RV. Oh, good call. Cool. That's absolutely right. Hang on, let me just quickly just mute this one. Uh, sorry, you're absolutely right. That should have been included in there. So uh, I think in terms of the pulmonary hemodynamics, maybe it would come into that. And I guess we'll talk about this a little bit here. Um, so tell me what you mean by yeah, pressure overload and volume overload. Just take us through that. Uh, so pressure overloaded is essentially, so volume overloaded is, is a large RV that's, um, that's, dilated to compensate for increased uh, volume essentially. Whereas yeah. pressure overloaded implies that there's septal dyskinesia and particularly in LV diastole, there's um, bowing of the um, of the interventricular septum into the LV. 
representing I it. Normally I have it's the, if it's going in diastole, that's going to be, so it's the interventricular septum getting pushed over. If it's over in systole, that suggests it's the pressure overload. If it's over in diastole, that suggests it's the volume overload. And I guess we can talk about, that sort of brings in core pulmonale, which we'll talk a little bit about. So, yeah, uh, yeah I'll say that back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go back down. Uh, I think you'll, yeah, yeah. And the, the way you can do that is often with, they sometimes talk about this. Um, so if this is the LV and that's the RV, they can often talk about the, uh, I guess in, in, in the literature, they've sometimes spoken about the D1 versus D2. And if you look at the ratio between those at different stages of the cardiac cycle, you get an idea of whether the septum is bowed over. If it's less than one, uh, obviously that means that there's some form of the septum being pushed over. And uh, depending on that's a systole or diastole, that would be pressure and volume overload respectively. I, I don't do this a lot, but if you're looking for the prize in the exam, maybe put that one in, I think. Yeah, nice. All right. Just in the meaning of time, let's move on to the, 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 the difficult one. So the question would be something along the lines of, you know, discuss the use of echo in the management of the patient with ARDS. I think the reflex and what most people seem to do is they just jump straight in and start talking about the stuff that we've talked about you know you've got to look at the RV size and RV function and of course we can talk about the difficulties with you know M mode assessment and how to assess pulmonary hemodynamics and and I think that's absolutely right I, I guess what I'd like to just try and discuss is how you answer this question you've got 15 minutes and how you try and answer this question so that you don't miss anything out so who wants to start this off where are you up to so Cotton, how do you reckon you start off this question in terms of how do you manage a patient with ARDS with echo? Well, it's one, you need to diagnose ARDS. 2012 Berlin changed the cardiac exclusion requirements from if elevated left atrial pressure was present pre-2012, ARDS was not possible to diagnose. Now it's a more nuanced thing where any elevated left atrial pressure of present should be adequate to explain the lung infiltrate. So ultimately it comes down to an expert opinion. Yeah, fair enough. And that's not necessarily the first thing I do, but that's the first thing I would write an answer. Cool. Yeah. So in the intro we'll talk about obviously, yeah, making sure you've got diagnosis and that's where left atrial pressure we can say is important. Yeah, and I think, you know, Probably you need to avoid wasting too much time describing left atrial pressure. Just to you know, say, you know, just you're assumed to know that. Yep. I mean, you say that. I mean, I think I think we've got to talk about left atrial pressure assessment. I, I might have time to write down. Yeah, let's talk about the fluid status, right? Cool. So, yeah. Yep. Um, so I would say first of all, you would use it to diagnose it using these criteria. You know. Yep. Cool. Second thing. Uh, Second point is need to exclude fluid overload. That's slightly different from the Berlin criteria thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, now the next thing that I would do is I think you would use echo to assess. So assume RDS is present, I would use it for a couple of things. One to assess the impact of ARDS on the right heart. Nice. Um, and I suppose the final, a couple of other things I would do. Um, I would use ECHO to guide by ventilatory practices. Nice. I would use echo to a shunt. Good man. Which may or may not be present. Fantastic. And I suppose just a quick word on, I would use echo to guide general hemodynamics as in any other pathology, something like that.
I think it's nice. I think, yeah, and again, I probably started by saying I find echo essential in my practice or very useful to manage these patients for all of those reasons. Beautiful. And then those are your headings that you go through and we just try and knock them off as we go. So let's talk about left atrial pressure, fluid assessment, right heart, Including, including um, corporal manelli, you know, presence. Very presence. nice, very nice, and PFO. So let's just go through, and then nice little conclusion at the top. So 15 minutes, remember? So let's knock them through. So it talks about left atrial pressure. Why is that important? Well, you sort of said, you know, so obviously if it's raised, you've got to make sure that you're not fluid overloaded. So maybe these are coming together. Uh, because if it's raised, it's a cardiogenic component to the exudates, isn't it? That's really yeah. what we're saying. Yep. How would you try and describe that quickly? Because remember, we've got to get through all of this stuff now. You've got like maybe a minute, 90 seconds to try and write down some of this. Give me the highlights four, that you put into that. The four best criteria for establishing raised left atrial pressure are dilated left atrium, elevated pressures on trustful valve um, regurgitation. And give me those pressures. So what would you say? Mm -hmm. Uh, sorry, you said the, it was raised left, uh, the raised pressures. Uh, how, how are you going to diagnose that? The TR greater than 2.8, dilated left atrium on an index value, um, E over E prime. Yeah, E over E prime. What's your number? 14. Use 14. Some people use 18. I guess that's the, that, that, that'll be the cutoff that they talk about in uh, you know, di diastolic dysfunction. Uh, some people would say, like uh, Michel Slama and some of those guys from France, they use 18 just because of that grey zone. Uh, yep. Just as an aside, but I think 14 sounds absolutely right. Yep. I'm going to pick you up on the TR. I think a TR, I don't reckon you can use it, man. You've got ARDS. I've no idea whether that's coming from here, and it's one of the problems that we've I'm got gonna... assessing diastolic dysfunction with these guys. No, I suppose what I'm saying is the criteria that are best validated for diagnosing and I'm using that really from the diastolic dysfunction criteria. There are many, there are many other sub ones but and I'd, and I'd argue that they ain't thinking in those guidelines and there's nothing about any ARDS patient in there at all. I know for I sure. think, I'd just be I think that would be a, as an examiner that would make me raise my eyebrows because I'd say well no mm -hmm. hang on man you can't use that because you've got a million of other things that are going to raise your TR jet. So yeah, each we prime greater than 14 I'll buy. Yep. I suppose the Absolute um, value of the E prime can be used. Yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Good call. And obviously, you know, if there is systolic dysfunction, um, you know, then, you know, so a reduced ejection fraction or reduced global longitudinal strain would be really nice. Yeah, absolutely. I really like that. Yeah, cool. And I think absolutely just writing left atrial pressure cardiogenic component, literally just dot, 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 tick, 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 tick. Beautiful. Yep. All right, let's, um, let's move on. Uh, Shalin, hello. Are you calling in from Singapore? I'm sorry, I, I muted you there. Shirley, can you, can you hear me, Shalin? Yep, yep. Hi, uh, welcome. You're from Singapore, is that right? Yes, that's right. Well, welcome. Thank you very much. I know you've just joined halfway through, but we're just sort of working our way through you know, a question that would be on the management of ARDS with ECHO. Do you, tell me how you'd, uh, when you're using ECHO in assessment of a patient with ARDS, uh, how can you help to make sure that you're not fluid overloaded? It's a tough question to come straight into the group with, but uh, <laughs> how, do you, how can you use ECHO for that? Um, well, I guess the easiest, one of the ways you can do is the IBC. Yeah, okay. But it may not be very useful if the patient's going to be intubated. Very nice. Um, you got could, ARDS on full mandatory ventilation. Yes, you could start off by just looking at the chamber sizes. Yeah, nice. Um, just grossly to see whether they are, they are grossly underfilled. Yeah. Um, and um, one way of looking, one way of seeing whether they are adequately filled is to do some form of um, dynamic maneuvers. Yeah, good work. And by that you mean, what, what um, maneuver? do you do uh, an expiratory hold or what, what do you do? So you can do a passive leg raise and then, yeah. and then um, see whether there's any change 
and say the um, the LVOT VTI. Yeah. And I think uh, what what numbers do you use for that? Um, thirteen percent or something. Yeah. I'm Sorry, exactly I right. no, can't, no. can't remember offhand. No, no, that's, that's absolutely perfect. So the evidence would suggest thirteen percent. I kind of it. I use that again. It's a little bit like using the E2E prime. And again, just stealing what Michelle Slam has told to me. And he uses 20% just because of the differences that you get and everything from the angle of assessment of the LVOT. And so for saying someone's fluid responsive or not, he uses the 20% mark. So I think if I'm trying to, the whole point with, I guess, with echo is I'm trying to make sure this patient isn't fluid overloaded. And I think that's if you've got a raised left atrial pressure and if you've got a VTI change that's, you know, zero when someone's being ventilated for ARDS that probably means that we might be able to diurese them a little bit I, I guess I want to make sure they're not underfilled if they're hemodynamically compromised and that's why I guess getting getting sort of somewhere near 20 percent probably is the way to go I think yeah nice uh cool I, I guess a, a really nice thing that would be here because we want to flu exclude fluid overload a really nice little sentence to include in this one I reckon it's really hard and I don't reckon echo is perfect, and you've got to have clinical assessment, of course. All right, let's move on. Um, we've got, who else do we have in here? Is it Lewis? Are we up to you, Lewis? Yeah. Uh, is that, no, sorry, there is someone else there, isn't there? Are we back to, yeah, back to Raymond. Um, so we talked a little bit about RV size and function, trying to figure out if someone's at risk. What kind of things would we also use in terms of the pulmonary hemodynamics for assessing the right heart? Because, of course, we, we've got to, somehow you've got to figure out, again, we've got about 90 seconds to write this down, that we'll talk about size and function. Mm -hmm. And what's the tricky bit is trying to figure out how to write down about RV size and function super quick mm -hmm. and about pulmonary hemodynamics. What, mm -hmm. what signs on pulmonary hemodynamics would make you think you've got an RV that's at risk? Because I think that's what this is all about. So it's all mm -hmm. about figuring out an at-risk RV. Yeah. So you can talk about the parameters that we talked about, which is uh, uh, evidence of RV um, dysfunction, so TEPSI less than 15, RVS prime less than 9.5, or fractional area change less than 35. Yeah. You can also talk about um, raised pulmonary pressures, so the RVS prime plus estimated RAP is you know, elevated, and that's difficult to okay. so what value you use. Um, but uh, a significant elevation would sort of make you more worried. Um, uh, and uh, you can also use acceleration time if someone's in sinus rhythm and not in, not tachycardic. Acceleration time can give you a, a, a good idea about what the pulmonary vascular resistance might be. Uh, so these are all clues about pick, trying to pick patients who might be at risk of a uh, failure of acceleration. And what numbers are you looking at with your pulmonary pressures and your TR and your pulmonary pressures and your pulmonary acceleration time? <laughs> <laughs> pulmonary acceleration, acceleration time probably less than 120 um, milliseconds. Okay. Um, pulmonary pressures, I don't actually have a figure in my head, but I mean, clinically, I'd be you know worried about 45 or more. Yeah, um, I just, yeah, I'd say acute change. How about that? Sure. I agree. And so, sorry, tricky question because I think you've got to have a baseline. That's why you need to, you know, I saying echo is useful. I think we'll talk about, you know, in your conclusion section, we've got to talk about repeated examination. Mm -hmm. Right, so if I've got, if I'm changing anything on a patient with ARDS, I want to particularly look at my pulmonary pressures because if you've got them going from 30 to 45 when you've increased the peak from 10 to 14 and the RV is starting to go down and the TAPSI is going down, you know, that's when we know that maybe we're at that at risk RV. And that's the kind of thing that I've never seen a candidate write in a DDU exam, but it's something that we do all the time, right? That's, yeah. that would be a big thing for me, you know, repeat exam and if something's changing, We've got to put that into clinical context, which is, you know, if someone's not writing that on the question, you know, that, that's a mark for me. Someone's got to say that I'm being a clinician and using the echo to integrate it into it. So, yeah, change in pulmonary pressures, pulmonary acceleration time. I use 90 milliseconds. That's probably, I've, I've got some, you know, there's some evidence to say that that's probably the most sensitive marker for determining increased pulmonary vascular as uh, the pulmonary vascular resistance of less than 90 they use 120 in the exact uh, in the guidelines for pulmonary hypertension but yeah the evidence would suggest 90 is a more specific cutoff just as 18 and 20 percent are used to try and get rid of that gray zone 
But there's another thing that's more important than the acceleration time for me. I find the acceleration time really super hard, right? Because it's, you know, you just move that, that uh, you know, the marker just like a tiny little bit and it goes from like 50 to 150, you know? Mm -hmm. what, I, I use the RVOT VTI, but I use it for something else. What's that? Um... Give me a, a Vishal, come on, man. You know, I, I hammer you with this all the time. What are we looking at? So uh, this one, I, you know, um, one more thing. I think when we are assessing, you know, right heart function in ARDS, yes, septal dyskinesia is very important. I think because that's one of the validated thing. Okay. And uh, so our RVOT profile, so flying W sign is the one thing which, you know, we, you know, I think you're asking for me to answer. <laughs> so it's a really useful one for me, Raymond. So it's just, you know, the normal profile looks like that. You can see that okay? And obviously the acceleration time is that time difference from when it starts to when it finishes. And that's the one that's hard. But if you've got the profile that looks like this flying W sign, really good example of increased pulmonary pressures or significantly increased pulmonary pressures. Um, and it's just, you know, you eyeball it and you can pick it up straight away. So yeah, that's, that's a good one for me of an at-risk RV. Uh, nice. All right, maybe just skip through. Uh, Carson, do you want to come back to me about PFOs? You talked about intracardiac shunts. What percentage of patients uh, have PFOs with, with ARDS? You there, Carson? <clears throat> Anyone else shout out? So it's 20% in the general population, but in severe arts, I think it's 40% are shown to have. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's about 20% as well. And that's the, this DESAP study. Maybe I can try and show it to you. I pulled it up just a minute ago because I forgot the bloody number. Yeah. Uh, I'll just share my screen with you. So this is the one. So the prevalence and prognosis of shunting. Is that coming up for you guys? Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. But just down here in the conclusions, they got uh, yep, yep. Yep, cool. 203 consecutive patients with the ARDS. Okay, it's obviously the, the Frenchies have done this. Okay, there's just one intensive care unit in France. And exactly as you said, you know, in, in the idea that, you know, one in four of us have a PFO, we got moderate to large pain frame and a value shunting occurred in 19.2, you know, 20% of patients with ARDS. You know, I think that's a lot more than, you know, I guess that's pretty interesting to me. Yeah, and I think it was a higher percentage in severe, wasn't it? That there was something. The other thing that that article, I think, showed that you can adjust that, that, that you can vary the percentage. Yeah, yeah, nice. Yeah. And yeah, so, compared to patients yeah. without shunting, patients had a poorer PF ratio. Yeah, exactly yeah. right. So that um, not fixed, yeah. Yeah, nice. Uh, yeah, so especially if severe. <clears throat> Okay, and uh, maybe we'll just talk a little bit about core pulmonale. What's the definition of core pulmonale? Who wants to take that? Why don't we pick on someone who we haven't had for a while? Lewis, are you there? Why don't you take us? Give, give me what core pulmonale is. Um, I, I don't actually know an echo definition. It, I'm, I, it's a clinical definition mostly, so I haven't actually heard of an echo definition. So it's, um, um, it's uh, fluid overload and... and um, right ventricular failure due nice. to a pulmonary diagnosis and um, uh, so acute core pulmonale would imply that you've got reduction in right ventricular function yeah excellent yeah because of a primary pulmonary diagnosis um, and I don't know anything on echo that would be specific. So any echo diagnosis of right ventricular failure that would be specific to core pulmonary. So uh, you've, you've got it all. And it's, uh, um, I was lucky enough to be writing a paper on this with people like Pinsky and Vion Baron. You should have heard the, the arguments about which went around between these super smart people about what, how do you diagnose core pulmonary. It was really interesting. And I think that the bottom line I took away is if you've got a big RV that you set, that's not functioning well, you've got the interventricular septum that's deviated and plus clinical signs of uh, the RV not being able to handle fluid. So that for me would be LFT derangement, acute renal failure, metabolic acidosis, 
bit of you know peripheral edema, that would be the sign that you've then got core pulmonale. So it's both echo signs and clinical signs of uh, fluid overload, I guess would be the, the, the or a failing RV clinically as well. And I suppose that, um, another thing that I have done, I haven't actually this written down here, but um, it's a, a change in right ventricular parameters with ventilatory parameters yeah, indicating nice. the right ventricle is just on the edge of coping. So yeah. if you put up the mean pressure, the mean airway pressure, and the right ventricle changes measurably somehow if the diameter changes but in diastole. Beautiful way and I think that ties into what we're talking about up here and here which is you know this is obviously where the lion's share of the, the question comes in and if you're trying to write about management just keep in the back of your head that you've got to get through all of this stuff that we kind of want to talk about but you know here's where it all is so how would you change it so I think it's exactly right you know we need to try and keep I'll, I'll be writing you know we want to keep our plateau pressures less than 30 we want to optimize our peak and we're repeating our clinical exam, looking for all of these signs if we think the right ventricle is at risk. And, uh, you know, so optimized people, I guess that's all mean airway pressure, whichever you, uh, oh, how do you do it? So, what do you call it, uh, uh, pulmonary pressures. You know, you want to optimize all of those, and if you're changing anything, do your exam again. Uh, and then I'd, you know, Finish up with an idea of talking about, you know, the, the obviously the importance of repeated exam, clinical context. Um, let's do a quick case, just we've got five maybe a few minutes to go. I'll just do one, maybe one quick case. Um, are there any questions on that? You know, as I said, this is a question that frequently gets asked. Very rarely do people ace it. So just again, I think the highlights for me are talking about how to pick up. A patient who is at, uh, sorry, optimized fluid status and left atrial pressure, figure out the patients who are at risk, talk a little bit about PFOs, and then talking about how if you're changing anything and particularly optimizing a ventilation, you come back and you assess this again. So regular assessment with echo, looking at what we talked about. Nice. Um, it's possible to uh, include uh, recruitment maneuvers under ventilation. Yeah, and totally. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think if you're doing recruitment maneuvers and you're assessing the right heart, absolutely. Uh, it's a um, little controversial, I guess. You know, I had one of my uh, ECHO fellows last year put talk about assessing the right heart with a recruitment maneuver, and one of the DDU examiners, uh, they didn't like it and they, and they failed it. So I guess we'll talk about it being it's, it's controversial, the use of ECHO and recruitment maneuvers, and maybe just, you know, hedging your bets, just keep it middle of the road and just say, you know, ventilation super important. If you're changing anything, just have a look at your right heart again. Um, sorry, guys. Actually, it's 12. Why don't we just save the cases for another time? I hope maybe we'll just leave it at that. Um, the last thing that we didn't get time to get onto is, I guess, try and talk about the difference between the use of maybe we say toe. You can using toe in these patients with ARDS is uh, is useful. Uh, but I find it really hard with toe, if we were trying to compare and contrast them, I don't know what you guys think, but I find it really hard to assess right ventricle size and function with toe. I think the pulmonary pressures can be good if you get that, you know, the high, um, that high view above the aortic valve, so high esophageal view, and you, uh, uh, and you do a little bit of retroflexion, you can get down onto the pulmonary artery nicely, you know, that's what we use to have a look for that saddle embolus, and just putting your, uh, pulse wave Doppler just before the pulmonary valve, you can get a nice alignment there to assess things like that. Um, but I find that often, the, you know, the TR stuff's really hard, uh, but it's obviously great for picking up PFOs. You can, I sometimes do things like recruitment maneuvers or changing ventilation whilst I'm doing the toe, and you can have a look at see if it's blowing out the RV or something. So maybe just think about that for the future, how to do toe versus transthoracic in patients with respiratory failure. And obviously, if they're not intubated, it's <laughs> really bloody dangerous. <laughs> um, that's about it. Is there, uh, I, I guess you please have unmute yourself. Are there any comments or thoughts? Can I check if the use of toe is recommended in the current ARDS management guidelines? Oh, my really? goodness. I'm so sorry. You're going to get me on that one. It certainly is if you talk to Antoine Villabarro. So these guys would say that they don't manage these guys without it. They're particularly looking for 
that uh, call Pominale. They're particularly looking for that, you know, big RV on the, uh, on the short axis view. And I'm sure you've sort of seen their gazillion papers on that. So they'd say that call Pominale happens, I think. Let me just find that for you. I'm pretty sure it's... Uh, they found it in, I think it was 20% as well, core pulmonale. 20%, yeah. 20%, I just, uh, where is it? Uh, so. yeah. well, I've got, in 2016, 700 people. Study. Yeah, nice. Something in there. All right. Let me just quickly just pull.